And I got a call from Brent, our alternate drummer who is here every other week, and he was in the hospital in America, and he, he said he didn't mind if I shared this. And he has some bleeding in his abdominal cavity, and they don't know what it is, and they're going in this afternoon, and I'm sure he's a little concerned, as I would be, we all would be, and Debbie is over in Columbus with the situation, so I don't know if he's alone there. I hope he's not, but we're going to be checking as soon as we leave church. But just, Father, in Jesus' name, I prayed with him on the phone, and we're standing in agreement, Lord, that you, your healing virtue is all we need. We look to you, the author, and the finisher of our faith, and with the stripes we were healed, and we stand on that promise, Lord. Touch our brother Brent, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, Reed Heffernan and messaged me last night, and he went through Friday before last, I think it was, about five hours of neck surgery. And he let me know last night he's back in Albany. He was, it was at Emory. He's back at home. He believes he's on the mend. So we're lifting Reed up in prayer and knowing he's going to walk out of this thing okay. And Joshua's baby boy, Harrison, had his tonsils out the day before yesterday? Thursday. Thursday. And Josh me and your mom were talking, and one of the things that stands out in the last 40 years in my life that is huge was after you had burned yourself and you were having to have that skin graft, and we were at the hospital, and they, we were walking down the hall, that gurney, and you looked up at us just so helpless, knowing that, not knowing all of those things. That was one of the hardest walks down that hall I can remember. And I know what y'all were going through, thinking about Harrison. You know, as you get older, you get to know everything's going to be okay. But when you knew and you got new babies with you, I know how it, how it was. And, but gosh, that was, a, that was a rough walk. Do you remember that? My tears. Mm, good night. Um, what else is going on? Kathy. Yeah, I just found out that Kathy is in the hospital. She broke her hip and she just found that out. Dear goodness. What is going on? And she, she's so bad about not letting us know what's going on. She never tells us. Well, I just figured y'all's too busy or something like that. We'll be checking with, with her. Bless her heart. And I think she broke something else too, didn't she? Bless her heart. Kathy's tough, though. She's as tough as they make them. Y'all ready to reason together today? Say, life goes on. Life goes on. They're going to be singing that John Mellencamp song in your head all day, aren't you? Oh, say, oh yeah, life goes on. Long after what? The thrill of what? <laughs> I don't know what that never done see what he said. <laughs> Y'all know Gargano's opened up again yesterday? And bless, good, gracious alive. Um, Tommy and Wendy were there, and we were planning on going, but we rode by and knew there were thousands of people <laughs> there. And so Wendy and them put in our order for us before they left. And thank y'all, they also picked up the tab. God bless y'all, you shouldn't have done that, but I'm glad you did. Uh, you, you forget with these $6 pizzas around here, you forget what, a, what an Italian pizza really tastes like. And John Gargano has it down. When we went to pick up our pizzas, he's only doing carry out with pizzas and salad. We went to pick it up. The dining room was full of people waiting for their order. And there was at least a 20 foot line outside of people waiting to get in. He didn't advertise it the night before he had turned the lights on. That's how folks have been wanting John, John Gargano back to open the doors. And I know why. That was so good. Thank y'all. God bless y'all so much. And I'll say something while I'm talking about folks doing things. That door right there has been hanging by one hinge now for years. <laughs> now, I'm going to get it. I'm going to fix it. <laughs> like Phil Dunphy. I'm going to fix that step one day. And uh, it's Dunphy, not Dunphy. And uh, I came in last Sunday and it was fixed. And nobody said anything about it. So I, I asked Charlie what it was, and Charlie squealed on Ralph. Ralph snuck in here and fixed it. Thank you, Ralph. 
that, that really, really touched me. That's the way it used to be. We would, something would go wrong and it would get fixed and I would even never know how it did, you know. But God bless you, Ralph. Thank you. It's so good to have you back. Amen. Yeah. Oh, boy. Y'all got any idea what's going on in the world? Have you figured out what you're supposed to do yet? Yeah. Well, please tell me. <laughs> I'm seeing, honestly, I am seeing the answers to these type of questions clearer than ever before. Daniel Skillman put this thought in my brain some years ago, and it stayed with me, and you hear me quote him a lot of times. The violence of the cross is the end of violence for all who understand what took place there. And that's so true when you think about that one thing, the innocent victim forgiving the ones in the midst of them murdering him. That is what the cross was about in demonstration to us about how we should lay down our life for others and turn loose of everything we have. And even Alexander, I've talked about him several times in the past. If y'all know anybody right now that's going through a death sentence, if they've got a bad prognosis, or if you know somebody or even you who are afraid of death, look up Eben, E-B-A-N, Alexander, and go to YouTube. Don't Google these things. You pay the $15 a month so you can get the ads going from YouTube and use it like college. There's so much there, and they're getting where they're not censoring as much as they used to. It's a lot better there, and I think it's going to be better as time goes on. In fact, I'm sure it is. Um, but just look up Eben Alexander. In, in 2008, he, he contracted bacterial meningitis and was in a coma for a long time, and he had a near-death experience. He was a, he's a neurosurgeon himself, and he had a near-death experience that changed his life as it changes everyone's life who has him. It changed, the, it changed the Apostle Paul's life, if that is what happened to him when he's talking about being caught up in the third heaven, and I believe it, believe it is. And he wrote a book called Proof of Heaven. And I've never read the book, but I've heard him tell his story over and over and over. And it always gives assurance of, of afterlife and life with God. And it takes away all the fear of death. It's really a good, good thing to listen to. And I, that has been on my mind last week to bring up. And again, this week, I don't know if that's for somebody. But he made the quote, he said, don't base your thoughts about God on man's theories. And that's what we've done. Don't base your thoughts about God on man's theories. They are better than a, what a chimpanzee could come up with, but then he says just barely. And that is the honest truth. And we have based our entire belief system not on the words of Jesus. We have based it on we, what we have decided it should be and not what God showed us it could be. I'm telling you over and over, and we've got so many different groups that all believe that they've got the right thing. But remember, our security is not in that. We've got everything figured out, and we're right. Our security is in the truth of a father's love for his children. There is one man's thought, though, that you need to base all of your beliefs on. And, of course, that's Jesus. Amen? Father, we ask you to direct our path today. Show us what we're to do. And help us to do what we would want to do, what you would want us to do instead of what we would want to do, Lord. There's always that battle there. And Father, we ask for you to side with us against ourselves so that we can follow you in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. I think without argument, everyone will agree, all believers would agree with this. Putting God's will over our will is probably the most important life lesson there is. Would you, everybody says that. I just want to do what the Lord would have me to do. And, you know, you look at their life and know they're living for themselves. And, I, you know, God, that's okay. It's very few people that I know are completely dedicated to God. And the, so many of them that I know that are, are from a religious structure and almost a fear basis instead of the delight of understanding what happens when you've got that constant give and take with God all the time, you know. Um, but I, I'm sure that is what any real believer wants. They want to lay down their will and take the fight. Nevertheless, when Jesus said that, nevertheless, I want, but my, my will is will my Father's in heaven. And we've been talking a lot about the spirit of truth dwelling in us. And right now, we are not in the middle of a great awakening. We are in the middle of the. This will be known, this era will be known as the great 
awakening, the revelation of things, the, the uncovering of deception that has been going on across the world for, for thousands of years. And I talked last week about the overall rise in consciousness that we notice in mankind. And I brought up as an example the manatee that used to be out at Tiff Park Zoo, that huge sea cow that would be in this container that it was not even big enough for him to turn around in his water. And he lived in there for years. And, and we would go and see him and walk around and eat peanuts and snow cones and not think much about it. But I guarantee you today if there was one like that, it would organically happen. Everybody would be in, up in arms about it. There wouldn't be a, 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 a thing on Facebook. If, if anybody heard about it, we'd be in, up in arms. Do you realize that? That's different. And at the same time, we're seeing a rise in the callousness and the rise in the violence and the rise in the cold-hearted nature of, that's somewhere in all of us, I think. But you see that? We're seeing that rise in empathy rising up. At the same time, we're having that rise of, of, of us leaning to our flesh instead of not the spirit. We're being bombarded every minute. I, when I wrote that word bombarded down, I don't think I've ever used that word. Do, I, do y'all ever hear me use it? And I decided to look it up. And, and the word means to be bombed continually with bombshells and other missiles. Well, every second now we are being bombarded with, with opportunities for growth. And at the same time we have been b- being bombarded with opportunities that would lead us to destruction. That's what's going on right now. It's about us growing up into things we're supposed to grow up in and and carrying out the will that God has for our lives. And we do have that side of us that is the consciousness is raising where we suddenly have compassion where there used to not be any compassion. But at the same time, we find that we can stop that compassion in a heartbeat and turn it into anger and want vengeance, you know. By the way, we've got those two things at, at war with each other. Romans 5.20, Paul says, Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound. The law, think about this. The, the offense, you can also use the word sin. It's not, not harmantano, the, the word we usually use that's translated um, sin. But it can also be interpreted as sin, and sometimes it is used as sin. <clears throat> the law entered in. when The law was given by Moses, and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So the law was given in order to cause us to sin. Do you get that? The law was given so that offense might abound, not just be there, but abound. I'm talking about bubbling over where it's everywhere. But where sin, at this time it, it's, it's the word, the Greek word harmantano, which means um, to miss the mark. It's the result of doing those things, those offenses. It's to miss the mark and so as not to share in the prize. In other words, miss God's best for our life. Moreover, the law entered so that we'll, we'll sin a whole bunch. But where we sinned a whole bunch, grace did much more abound. The grace is what we need. The grace of God outdoes the sinning at every, every level. Amen? It much more abounds. Isn't that a good, good, good thought to have right now? No matter what you're doing, no matter what you might be doing, no matter what you did last night, the grace of God is stronger than that. Amen. We desperately are living in a time where we need truth. With everything that's going on in the world, we can't afford to get things wrong. When Jesus said on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do, which by the way, I think is probably the best example in the Bible of grace abounding more than the sin. There was the murder of G of an innocent victim, but the grace of God was dropping all charges. That's where grace is, is, is much more abounding than the, than the sin. But when, when Jesus says, we don't know what we're doing, and I've come to find out since that, that scripture became embedded in me, I've come to find out we really do not know what we are doing. But we're living in a time where we cannot afford to know not what we're doing. We're living in a time where we've got to be prepared for things. What's going on right now in our great nation is not limited to here. It's, it's worldwide. 
our government agencies, uh, not unlike other government agencies uh, across the world over the past hundreds of years, and a lot of them are like this and a lot of them are not, but right now just about all but a few of them are moving toward a place where the government is, is being or already is weaponized against the people who have opposing views, who speak out anything with their thoughts about the way things should be that opposes with the way the governing body has decreed and decided that's the mainstream narrative and that's how it should be. And the ones that are not in lockstep with the government, uh, as presented by the legacy media, they're the ones that are, if you're not in lockstep, they're the ones the government is coming after. Australia, they're already locking up people. Canada, they're already coming to your house and talking to you. In America, the, our justice system has been weaponized against those that speak out their beliefs against what they want us to comply to. I, I, I say I will not comply. I will not. One of our protected, the First Amendment, the Constitution is just absolutely fabulous. And the rights that it guarantees us are not rights that it gives us. The, the rights that are in the Constitution are unalienable rights. These are rights that we were born with. And of the five things that is guaranteed in the First Amendment is freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the freedom to gather together, um, freedom of the press, and... Right? No, that's the Second Amendment. And the right to redress our government. The right to call, right to call them up downtown and say, what the hell are y'all doing? Let me, that is our right. And right now, if you talk against what the government is doing, they will come after you. That's just the truth right now. Do you remember, I'm sure you don't remember, but you, you remember Al Capone in the late 20s? Um, when, during Prohibition when they uh, made alcohol illegal, which wasn't none of their business to do. Who do they think they are, you know? Like I was going to fix them. You take something away from folks and see how bad it makes them want it. You know, that's, I, I've said so many times, back when it, pot was illegal and you get locked up, it was fun because we were doing something that was forbidden. But nowadays you can buy it at the curb store. Huh? It ain't so much fun no more, you know. <laughs> Not that I would know those things. That's just what I've heard when I talk to people in, <laughs> out in the street every day. But Al Capone, they could not get him. They tried, and he was so far detached from the actual footmen that he had out, they could not find anything to get him. They finally found out they could get him through the income tax laws. And so they went after him that way. That ain't stopped. Do you know that last year there were 87 thousand armed internal revenue service workers high, not, not 870, not 8,700, 87,000 armed IRS agents were hired. And since 2008, they have bought $35 million worth of military-style weapons. And since 2020, they bought $10 million worth of weapons and ammunition. These are IRS agents. What is going on? That ought to have you trembling in your boots. 87,000 armed. I mean, when you think of an IRS agent, you think of a guy with, with, with a for stuff in his pocket, you know, and he's a, a, a wall-hugging nerd that's going to come over and go over your numbers, not come at you with ammunition and guns. What, what in the world is going on? Um, it ain't about taxes. I'm telling you, it's not about taxes. I'll be so glad when everything turns around and the illegal income tax is done away with. Can I get an amen? amen. It ain't about taxes. It's about us being in lockstep or else. I saw, I didn't know if I should bring this up or not, but I, I told y'all sometime back, it's like within the last year or so, maybe the last year, it's like a hand has been removed from my mouth and I can now say things that I know I wasn't supposed to say. I'm still real cautious what I say and I don't want to offend anybody. I want everybody to at least give what I say a second look. Ask God about, most importantly, ask God about the things I'm saying and ask him to reveal truth. The spirit of truth dwells in you. And I, I'm just doing what I believe is right and what I believe is, is the way the Lord is, is leading me. Um, you know, Chuck, I heard Chuck Schumer talking about 
about someone they just keep piling indictments on who is this, our it, present president's most likely one to beat him in 2024. I'm going a long way around and not saying his name, ain't I? Chuck Schumer told Rachel Maddow, he said, oh, the IRS has six ways to Sunday to get him. In other words, it don't matter if it's true, we'll make up something. And that's exactly what the government is doing. And it's not going to stop high up. It's going to stop wherever they need to shut a mouth. So, are y'all with me? Yes. All right, don't leave me, please. Martin Niemöller, a Lutheran pastor in Germany toward the close of the, of the war, he said these words. He said, first, they came for the communist. And I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialist, and I didn't speak out because I'm not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I didn't say anything because I'm not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. Why should I speak out? I'm not Jewish. But then they came for me. And there was no, le- no one left to speak out. That's a scary thought. No one is exempt to the tyrannical move that is going on worldwide. They want every one of us, unless we're on their side and we are their puppets, they want every one of us under their thumb and management. I told you Agenda 2030, which was calling for the reduction of our population to 500 million by the year 2030. That means six and a half billion people will have to somehow be done away with. I don't, they're not going to make it. In fact, this, folks, this thing is done. God has already won this thing. Amen. I'm telling you, God has won. We're going to be okay. Amen. But we desperately need to make right decision. I told you before, if right now we're at a place, if you make a wrong decision, it can literally kill you. The things that are being put before us, if we make a wrong decision, it could literally take you out. We have to be cautious. He, you got ears to hear, please hear me. I, I brought up before about being very cautious about who you choose to believe is good and who you choose to believe is, is bad. I think that's one of the reasons Jesus was so adamant about judge not unless you want to be judged the same way. But I think a lot of the people that we're seeing now as being good are going to come out as evil. I told you last week a couple of things in my people that I voted for that turned out to be some of the most evil people that have ever lived. And it was a hard thing for me to accept, but you have to be flexible. But right now, until this thing plays out, be cautious about determining if someone is either on the side of good or on the side of evil. I promise you they're on one or the other, but you must be cautious about it. Let the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. Now, when you see someone who is killing, stealing, and destroying, you automatically know, and that person you know to stay away from and shy away from his beliefs, right? But the one that is there to help mankind, that's the one that you you need to tend to, to move toward. We have, the problem is that we have it because of the media and music and movies and TV, we have an unnatural attachment to people that we will never meet, never have met. We've never gone out to dinner with them. But we have these beliefs about them because we've got this sycophant thing in us where we're just starstruck by somebody who is famous and we begin to think these positive things about people. there's There's a believer in this town who won't have anything to do with me because he thinks that I have mixed in the world, with, but he loves some of the most devil-bound musicians in the world because he has, has an attachment with them. We get an attachment with these people, and it's hard for us to believe that they can't be everything that we thought they were when we helped put them upon the pedestal. You understand? I was talking to you when I brought up who it was that it was the the Bush family. I thought they were the finest, most upstanding Christian family in the world. I thought he was a great leader. And then I come to find out, no way. My goodness, George H.W. Bush was just one of the most evil men that ever lived. And we'll be finding that out. The reason I bring these things up, because when the truth is revealed, I want people that are not here to remember these things and that, so they might know they can find a place where they can find some daily bread that will be fitting for what they're going through. Does that make any sense? Yes. 
just reserve judgment until it's proven out. I know, I know. I'm, people at home are probably thinking, and you're probably thinking, hey, what in the heck has this got to do with a, with a Bible message? What has this got to do with, with learning about Jesus? When Jesus preached, he preached the good news, but he also talked about things that they were about to experience. This was in A.D. 30 to 33 when he was preaching, and around 40 years later, Jerusalem was destroyed by Rome, and he was, he was warning them about how to respond, how to act. And, and he's always telling them about how to treat people. Those things are always here. When he's talking about judge not lest you be judged, when James says be swift to hear and slow to speak, it's all about these things. When you see other things going on, you just need to be quiet and pay attention to what's going on before you make your judgment, right? You got that? Right, we're, we're at a place right now, as I've said several times, where bad decisions can literally kill you. And at the very least, if they don't kill you, they can rob you of time and energy. And I don't know about you, but I don't know of anybody that isn't already complaining about being run out of energy and time. Amen? We can't afford to waste our time on that. So we've got to know how over the next coming months and maybe years, I think it's going to be a lot quicker than that, make right, just right decisions. Um, last, when I did that three or four weeks thing about the key, the kingdom keys, that, that, that things that me and Susie used in our life every day and every night, it's the way we make our decisions. And one of the main ones, and I believe it was the first one I brought up, was the one that I got from my brother, my oldest brother, who's now deceased back in the 80s. I can remember the whole situation. He was sitting on the couch. I was sitting in a chair. We were, I know right where we were at 11, 13, 8 Baker. And he was telling me, when you argue with yourself, you lose. That was what he showed. That's been one of the main things about everybody always at one time or another decides they're going to turn on, they're going to turn over a new leaf and they're going to walk the straight and narrow. And what stops you from walking the straight and narrow is when you begin to romance the things that you used to do. You begin to argue with yourself and before you know it, you are back doing the things you used to do. Because when you argue with yourself, you are going to lose did y'all get that? All right. If you get into a bait with yourself when it's time to make the decision, nine out of ten times, if not ten out of ten, you're going to end up doing your will instead of what God wanted you to do. When I said that I'm hearing from God like I never have before, I grew up, I grew to hate when I heard religious or preachers talk like that, about I read, the Lord says to me, I got to where I could not stand to hear that. And it, and it has a good basis. When Susie and I, when I went out visiting a church in 1989, we'd been walking with God for eight or nine or ten years, something like that, and we got invited by Lee Newell to come over to that church, which is now Grace City. And at the time, it was the fastest growing thing in Albany. And we went there, and within two months, I was on staff. In fact, I was the first person to go on staff besides the church secretary. And I, they were just showing up. I ain't got a high school diploma, and they, they put me on staff over there. But we were around people that we thought really had a high level of, of, of spiritual growth going on, and a lot of them did. And there were a lot of ladies there who really would go around having words for people from the Lord, and we thought that was genuine, and every time it was from the Lord. Because me and Susie, the previous eight to ten years, we had been hearing from the Lord and talking to each other like that. And we were in the hallway over there one day, and one of these ladies walked up to Susie and said something like, the Lord says to me, the Lord speaks to me that, that you're having lower back problems. She hadn't had any lower back problems. But she did by that evening. <laughs> she did by that evening. What happened? The, power, the devil ain't got no power. And that girl, I don't know if she, but usually what people are doing when they do that, they, for some reason, man has this ego thing going on the inside of him. And I have done it before. We've probably all done it. Where you want people to think that you have got a hotline to God. Or God speaks to you. You need, you, you need me in order for you to walk a good, and that ain't the way it is. We talked about the scripture two weeks before last where, where, where the Bible tells that you need no man that should teach you. 
The Holy Spirit is sent to teach the church. Amen? Amen. And, and that's what happens. That power that Jesus said is in us, the devil has been stripped of all his power. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. He did. The devil has no power. He gets it. He uses our power. He knows how to manipulate us and turn our faith into believing for those bad things in our life. That's what happened to Susie. Susie began to expect something was going to happen with her back. And she went through absolute misery where she could hardly get out of bed. It was that serious. Why? Because over the, the previous eight or nine years, our believers were developed. We were out there in the woods on the river living and learning these things, and we were seeing them work. And our faith was developed, and it was strong. And she put her belief in what that girl said, that, oh, she must hear from God. Something must be fixing to happen. Well, something happened. We realized it after a, a, a time, and we rebuked it. We prayed about it, and she walked out of that thing. And it didn't take, didn't take just that long before we realized what had happened to us. You can't afford those kind of things. The thief comes not but to kill, steal, and destroy. And I told you all major, every major thing that we have anything to do with health care, any kind of government, everything, school system, everything has been infiltrated by the enemy. And the one most important thing that's been infiltrated by the ministry and is never talked about is the doggone church. And I didn't mean to call church doggone, but you know what I'm talking about. Where, where, if you were the devil, where would you go to start getting people on the wrong track? Church. At the railroad station, where they get on board, right? Yeah. That's where you need to get, get people on, off track, is throw them off at the beginning. And there we get down to, and the Bible warns us, the tradition of man causes the Word of God to be of non-effect. And that's what's happened. You see people that have been in church all their lives, and they ain't got the spiritual, spiritual sense of a 14-year-old. Give me a minute here. I don't want to turn anybody off, but I do feel that I am receiving inspired direction like I never have before. I, mean, I, I know I am. And I say that not to lift me up, but to say to you, you should be realizing that in your life also. I shall pour out of my spirit on all flesh. We all should be, everybody should be hearing from God for themselves. Yes. We all understand what intuition is. We talk about it a lot here. We talk about it in a lot of different words. What if when we're growing up, if we've been taught in school, which is <laughs> a joke, isn't it, about, the, about a God thing like this, but if you're in Christian school, maybe, if you've been taught that intuition if that that we call intuition, if we've been taught that, that it is God directing us instead of, it, oh, that must be God directing you. And so I think you've got good intuitions. You must have heard from God. And we do, when we get in church, we quickly change that word intuition to hearing from God. Have you noticed that? But what if we'd grown up thinking that? If we grew up thinking that it was not some other mechanism that was going on inside us when we would just sort of know what you should and sort of know what you shouldn't do. And the thing about it is, hindsight is 2020 because we always know what we should have done. Huh? Yeah. Something told me. Something told me not to. Something told me I should have. If it had been taught to us, if it had been taught to us in church, maybe it could have spilled over into schools. I was taught, Susie and I, in, beginning in 1981, I think. We were taught by faith people who invited us to examine their lives, and we did. We examined their lives by, by examining the people that were around them, that had been around them all their life, and did all the research. We would go to the conventions, get to know them, get to know their people, and we knew that they were living out that, that they were talking about. And, and, you know, and those are people, sadly, that I can't even tell y'all their names because, as I said, the church has been infiltrated. The church has canceled them years ago in conjunction with the mainstream media. The media's canceled them, and so has the church, where if you bring them up, everybody in the church will immediately begin to sound like a snake hissing talking about them. 
I, I mean, I can bring up one of them that was not my teacher, but one that one frequent I'll probably understand. This was not, I mean, I, I loved his daddy. But if I bring up Joel Osteen, immediately he's been canceled by not only the mainstream church, but the mainstream media also. Do y'all get that? Dear God, y'all get that? Thank you. Excuse me, I didn't mean to shout. Jesus knew how to follow the thought. The Bible says he grew in stature and in wisdom. So that means he had to learn some things. He knew how to follow the Father's plan for his life, and he plainly showed us how to do it. He plainly showed, right, right here, showed us how to do it. And this is the pattern. It's a scripture I use a good bit because it's a scripture I use a good bit. This is the pattern that God is giving to you personally this morning through his precious son, Jesus. It's him talking. And he says in John chapter 5, verse 30, this is Jesus talking. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. He's saying that because he's showing you, you. He's showing you can't either. He said, I can, in fact, in, in John chapter 15, where it says, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he goes on and says, apart from me, one translation says, cut off from me, you can do nothing. Same thought right here. Jesus says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, talking about hearing from God, gets the word for that what to do, that intuition that something told me. As I hear, I judge or I decide. Some translations say decide. And my decision is right. My judgment is just, is what the King James says. My decision is right. Why? Because I seek not my own will, what I want to do. In other words, I do not argue with myself. Growing up, he had honed that gift of hearing from God. He had fine-tuned it through experiences, through things where he did that didn't work out good. Why? Because he consulted his own will. There has never been a time when God has impressed upon me to do something when there was not something else that I would rather have been doing. You hear me? There's never been a time, except when we started the church, and then, then he sent everybody in the world to talk me out of it, you know. When he went those kind of directions, man, I plow ahead, and I'm like that. I can't hear what nobody's saying because I know that I've, I've sort of heard from God about those things. Think about it. I, Jesus is saying, as I, I can of my own self do nothing, but as I hear from God, I decide, and my, decide, my decision is always right, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Companion scripture that you know I'm fixing to read now is Isaiah 30 and 31. It says, thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand, and you turn to the left, to the left. As you're walking, not it don't say nothing about you standing still. As you're walking, you hear. He told Abraham to go to a place that I will show you. So we just move forward, believing that God's going to direct our steps. We have that God-given intuition, but our problem is there is always at least one voice, and usually two other voices, trying to talk us into doing something else. Have you noticed that? It's the voice of our will. I wanted to go to the game. I wanted to go home and watch TV. We were going to go out to eat tonight. And there's also other voices that will try to talk you out of you. You don't want to help them. My, they got themselves in that fix. They can get themselves out of it. You know, those kind of thoughts. There lies the problem. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man. There's a way, it always, when we argue with ourselves, it seems like the right thing to do. It seems like that's, this, yeah, this is what I need to do. There's a way that seems right to, right to a man, but the, way, the, the end thereof are the ways of death. You can be killing yourself a little bit at the time by not listening to that still, small voice. There's an, all, there's an overall theme to the gospel, and that's what the word gospel means. Goodwill. Good news, good favor, healing, protection, safety, 
Whatever you need in your circumstance right now is what the word gospel means. Now, I brought this up a couple of weeks ago, and I need to bring it up again. We see in the Bible, before the crucifixion, we see Jesus and his disciples going around preaching the gospel. If I ask any mainstream believer, what is the gospel? They will say, well, it is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and our deciding to repent for my sins, to quit smoking, drinking, cussing, and running around and to tell Jesus we ain't going to do that no more and ask him to save us. That's the gospel. I can't find nowhere where Jesus or the apostles, when it says they were preaching the gospel, that isn't what they were doing. The Bible says they went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. When Jesus showed up at the temple that day after he was baptized and the Holy Ghost descended upon him and he read from Luke and he said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your air. And it's what? He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, give eyesight to the blind, to all of these things, to fix all of our broken stuff, which is what the word salvation means. Come on. Do you tell me we ain't been infiltrating when we get the word salvation screwed up? Or gospel? Isn't that serious business? And I know I'm upsetting a lot of people, and I know it's a huge pill to swallow. Take it out, get your knife out, and chew just a little bit at the time. That's the way you have to come about these things. You have to approach these things a little bit at the time. And listen, these things that I'm talking about are not exclusive to me. People, new believers, that's the way they're learning, straight from God. And it's so weird. It was like when Susie and I got married, Susie didn't have to be taught these things. She was teaching them to me. It's like they were somehow in her. The, the wisdom that she has about how to handle things is in her. It was in her when we re-met back in 1975. You know, it's amazing how God can do that. God will put you with somebody. If, if you ain't got what it takes, he'll put somebody in your path that's got what it takes. And you might be what somebody needs. You might be that what somebody else needs. You might be what somebody else needs. It's all good news, isn't it? The gospel. The problem is we're so established in our ways and like I say, these things I know are hard pill to swallow. And it's, it's hard. If you ever like had an old table and you, it's got so many coats of paint of it, you can't, can't get them off, so you're going to paint it. And first coat don't get it through. You've got to put another coat on. You can still see the old color. And you have to, that's how this is. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. You have to hear these things over and over before they begin to penetrate through. And then after they do, the, 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 the weathering of, of, of just life happening, you have to go back in and paint the table after a few years. Just like the Bible tells us we need to give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest at any time they'll slip. And that's what happens to believers. It happened to Susie and I at a crucial time in our life when we were on staff at another church. My faith slipped because they were teaching other things. And it just put us in a, 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 a nosedive. But we knew what was going on. We backed up, prayed, and turned our life right back around. Um, you just got to keep on painting these things that we talk about week in, week out. Over and over, day after day, we have to keep God involved. And as life happens, here's what's so cool about this when you live this way. Life happens and you look back on it and you see all the things that life brought you and you realize you're still standing. Everything is still good. You still got joy. You're enjoying your life. God got you through all that and now you're ready for this day. You know he'll get you through whatever you're facing now. And I'm telling the things that we're going to face right now, you will get through them. You believe me? Almost everyone we're close to seems to be in crisis in one form or another, either in their immediate family or their extended family or in their finances or their, their health. Remember when Jesus said, don't call me Lord. What he said, why are you calling me Lord if you're not doing what I'm saying? You're hearing me, but you're not doing it. God wants to be Lord over your health, over your finances, over your relationships, your marriage, your emotions, over all of your life. You can put every bit of it under his authority. We're living in a time right now where the blinders are coming off, the deceptions are all being revealed, the lies that we've heard, the history that we've been lied to about. It's the truth is being revealed a little bit at the time to us. And when you see these things, you've got 
to understand that it's God that is revealing them. You can't resist the movement of God. If you do, you will wind up on the wrong side of what's going on. You can't afford to be on the wrong side. He, he, God will be Lord over everything you allow Him to be Lord over. He'll be, if you want to raise your family on your own without God, go ahead. It's so much easier, and it's easier just to trust God. Yes. I mean, that's, that's the only thing. And right now, we've got children and grandchildren all over the place. I cannot be concerned about every, it would drive me crazy. We trust God. We trust God with everything, and that's the way He wants us to be. He is trustworthy. Yes. Amen. He's not like us. He don't lie. Amen. But it's all going to be according to us being hearers and doers. Here's my a question I have for you today. In the process of life happening and everything that's going on in the world right now, do you realize when God is speaking to you personally? Have you caught on to those moments? Do you understand when you're hearing from God and not just from your, your, your brain or your mind. And sometimes they can go hand in hand. Are you noticing the synchronicities in your life? Are you noticing when you're at the right place at the right time and you just suddenly you go into the store and what you're looking for, you get the last one. Those kind of things happening in your life. Those are little, just the, the, the universe shouting out to you that you're on track. You have to look for those things. And if you're not seeing them, then that gives you cause to back up, say, God, what am I, where am I missing it? What do I need to do? How do I need to turn this thing around? But do you believe, I'm asking you a serious question, do you, how many of you right now believe that God is guiding you in things? I'm going to put you on the spot. And, yeah. 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 That's good. That impresses me. I had to have a talk with you, boy. <laughs> That thought that God, that some people have a hotline to him, or some people can hear better than us. I had somebody call me the other day, two days ago. I've never met him. And he said he might be here today, and he could be. I don't know. And um, I, we had had a miraculous healing out on 19 with a fellow who was terminal and was just about dead with cancer. And that was 20-something years ago. And this fellow that calls me is still working with him. We watched God touch this man. He didn't much care about God, his, his, his girlfriend or his wife, I can't remember, made him visit. And we, he came down front and we prayed a prayer of faith over him and that cancer was gone like that and he's been healthy ever since. He's still working and he, he's older than I am. Um, he's still working, I think, construction and stuff like that. Um, but I, I wish I had it in my pocket and I could hand that to people. But we're told to just walk by faith. It's by faith, by believing. And when faith is working in your life, it looks like faith ain't working at all. When faith is working its hardest, it looks like you're going backwards sometimes. That's why you have to learn to stand. In the day we're living in right now, you've got to stand. You've got to be, are your eyes being awakened to the corruption and the deceit and how every, all, uh, every one of the conspiracy theories have been proven out to be true. Are y'all seeing that? Yes. Yes. That's what's going on right now. Good gracious alive. Um, I'm going off track here. I don't know why I am. Jill Biden's ex-husband said he couldn't take it anymore. He had to go tell what he knew about the crime family that's in that house that's white. Um, he said when he was going through the divorce with Jill Biden, Jill was evidently already with, with Joe, and going through the divorce, he said he was more than generous to her. He, was over, over the, he said he gave her a townhouse, gave her the Corvette, was, was supplying very, he's a, this is a wealthy family. And one of the lawyer Bidens came up to him and said, if, and he said he had a house that was in Washington, it was worth about $35,000, $40,000. He said it's worth a lot of money now, but he said it back then it wasn't. And the guy said, if you don't give her this house, you're gonna, we're, we're coming for you or something like that. And he did not acquiesce. He, he didn't bend and do it. And he said a short while later, him and his brother were both indicted by the, by the Connecticut Department of Justice for ta income tax evasion over owing 
thousand dollars in combined in back taxes, and it was a felony charge. He said, that's how strong that family is with the Department of Justice. He said, they have done me like this now for 37 years. He said, that thing back then over the $8,000, he said, it has caused a rift between me and my brother to where we're just now beginning to talk again and being able to talk with each other and speak. But yet, we see the president's son owe $2.2 million in taxes for money he earned from governments and bribery and things like that, and he is charged with a misdemeanor. We've got to open our eyes and see this is not right. Something is very awry in our leadership. Do you see that? All of these absurd things that are going on are, being going, are going on so you can see them and you can wake up to what's going on. I'm telling you, there's a coalition of good out there that God is running. I'm telling you, there's a coalition of evil. We call it the cabal, the deep state, whatever you want to call it. It is there. It has been the puppeteer of this place that we call home for thousands of years. It's been calling the shots and it's had us in slavery. Even if you don't even realize it, we've been in slavery. Their days are over. The the time period, the thousand year rest is right around the corner. It, the earth leases up that is talked about in the gospel of Mark and they are being evicted. Their time's up and right now you have a part in it. You have a part in it to walk strong and in faith and to help those who don't know what's going on and are so afraid and are, are playing along with and seeing the destruction in their life, telling them, honey, there's a better way. There's a better way you can walk in this thing. One of the main things that's going on, like I said, is the deception that's, that's happening. You know how your GPS operates in your car? And I'm telling you, it don't operate the way you've been told. There's no, there's no way in the world that I'm driving down the road and a signal from my car is going up 22,000 miles and a calculator calculation thing is happening and coming back down 22,000 miles to instantaneously to tell me I've got to turn left in 30 feet. That even sound reasonable? I don't know if you know this, but GPS is not available out across the ocean. Pilots lose it in their aircraft when they're going across. I'm not going to get into what it is right now, but you know how it works. Have you ever been using your GPS to go somewhere and it tells you to turn a different way than you usually go? And you think, well, doggone it, I'm going to go the way I know to go. I'm not going to listen to the GPS. And you go and immediately it starts telling you to do a U-turn. Or well, then it tells you to do something else to get back to the route. But soon, it's going to say, okay, you ain't going to do it. So they're going to recalculate the route. You have within you the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, it's stronger than any man-made GPS. And when you make a wrong move, it automatically recalculates the way to get you to the destination. And the destination never changes. It never changes. And you can, it don't matter if you mess up immediately. He ain't got to feel, well, what are we going to do about it? Immediately, the route is recalculated. And what the right people are in your path, immediately, God is that fast. You'll hear the right song on the radio, or you'll run into somebody that'll give you a clue to what needs to happen in your life. Depend on that way of life, and that way of life you will see is already in front of you with synchronicities everywhere you look. I just love it when we have them happening one after the other. Some days it's like that. Just it wouldn't, if, if I hadn't been, if I'd been a minute later, I would have missed out on something. How many times do we have that happen? I love it. I'm going to go ahead and close. I, 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 dear folks, I try to narrow these things down to where we can get in and out of here, and I just, it don't work. I was going to finish up last Sunday's, and I left about half that message hanging in the, in the trees somewhere. Oh, boy. A few, few minutes ago when I said that we're to get our thoughts about God from one man, that man is Jesus. And John 17 and 18 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. You want to know about God? Go to Jesus. Don't go to the Old Testament. Don't go, I mean, this, you'll find Jesus all through the Old Testament. 
but you'll also find our projected God in the Old Testament that looks surprisingly a whole bunch like us that wants to get even, that wants to slay the enemy, that wants to kill. And I'm not saying there aren't evil entities, but I'm talking about humans right now. I'm not talking about the devilish realm. Amen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and find where I said close. Where did I put that? There we go. Now, as I said a minute ago, we are being bombarded with two things at once, maybe three things, but we're being bombarded with opportunities for you to grow, and at the same time, we're being bombarded with opportunities for you to become cold and callous and vindictive. And some of us, like me, I have some of those traits real strong in my life, and I have trouble with them. And I have to work on them all the time. I, I'm, I'm easily angered, and I don't like that about myself. But I understand now what to do. I don't, I don't understand it for years, and it hasn't been an, been an issue except that it, does, the enemy don't want to leave nobody alone. He's always going to be putting thoughts in your brain to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. How many of y'all are famous for doing the wrong thing at the wrong time? But just understand, in the coming weeks and month, in fact, right now, we already are being faced with having to make the most important decisions of our lifetime. And oops, ain't going to get it. You're going to have to know who to trust, and you're going to have to know who not to trust. You're going to have to know who to get your information from and who to shut down. And some people, you don't please get the thought that you have to agree with everything somebody says in order to receive from them. That's just not going to happen. It's not, they may be seeing things from a different perspective than you are. They might be wrong about some things. Nobody's right but Jesus. Ain't but one perfect, right? That's Jesus. We're all just, just sort of groping around in the dark trying to figure this thing out. But bless God, we're a bunch of folks here in this room that are trying to figure things out. I want to know the truth. That's my prayer every day, Lord. Guide me in the truth. Show me what to do every night. But you can usually know by the fruit of the, if the people are producing life and life abundantly in their life and the lives of people that are close to them, that's somebody you can usually trust. If you see a wake of hazard and just jump behind them, then that's somebody you might want to shy away from. You know, don't, don't go, to, don't go to, <laughs> to a church where the preacher just got divorced because he had his third affair with the secretary and and, you know, this guy out of rehab, and uh, you don't want to be going to that guy. Of course, they'd keep all that stuff secret, wouldn't they? <laughs> don't we? <laughs> I'm teasing, y'all. Don't forget, what if, what if you mess up? You're going to mess up, but you get a recalculation before you can even snap your fingers. going to be telling you what to do in 20 feet. Amen. But you have to make the quality decision to follow God in the things that you believe he's telling you. And you have to do it consistently. If you're believing for healing, you've got to consistently be believing for healing. You can't be believing for healing one minute and then trying to plan your funeral the next. You've, in, in consistency lies the power. Remember that. Also, inconsistency, when you're not consistent, there's a power in that also. But when you are consistent in the things you believe, that's where the power will be. Did y'all get anything out of this that I don't know if I tied it together with? I had a bunch more stuff in there, as I always do. Uh, don't let people lead you who are not walking down the path that God would have them to walk down. I'm, I'm being careful with my words. Jesus says the, the, the gate is narrow that leads to life and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And he ain't talking about being eternally punished, y'all. He's talking about right now. He says few will find it. There's a way that you can walk before God where things will go right in your life more than things will go wrong in your life. 
but you have to receive guidance and counsel from people who are also walking down that path. You can't get your advice from somebody who's always had have big things going on in their life that are causing destruction in their life, their family, their children's life, their finances. You need to get advice from people who are consistently walking in the power of God or walking in blessings and not curses. And I, I don't know if, if I worded that right. Does that make sense? Father, let this word, as feeble as it was, let the seed, the good seed of it, strike the soul of the heart and bring forth fruit. Father, I ask for a hundredfold return on the word sown. I love you, Jesus. I love you. Thank you for empowering us and walking with us and being with us. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said? Amen. Amen. Am I forgetting anything, baby, do? I'll see y'all next Sunday. Stanley, would you dismiss him in prayer, please, sir? No, give Stanley a hand. He just does this all the time. And <laughs>